Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I am with Inspire Ministries and I'm glad that you are here with me today. Today I just have something that I want to talk about very quickly and typically it's not something that I really do on this platform. I do have linked and I'll go ahead and link it down below. I do have some videos, a video series that I did last year called Being a Godly Wife. It's a godly wife series that I did. There were four videos that I did. One was alive and that was the session number four that I did. Um, again, I will have them linked down below. So it is content that I've covered before, but I really felt impressed upon my heart this morning because I have had reoccurring messages from people on this topic. And so because of that, I felt like God was really wanting me to highlight this in a video. And so that is what I'm going to do today. I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement. If you find yourself, woman, in a relationship right now with someone, whether it be your spouse or not your spouse, maybe it's just somebody that you're dating, and you feel very frustrated, especially if you are married to them. If you find yourself frustrated because you are unequally yoked, you are a believer, you are following Jesus, you are pursuing Christ, and maybe that's new. Maybe you were married 20 years ago and this new relationship with Jesus is something that has only been new to you. It's only something that you have pursued the last few years of your life. Maybe you are dating somebody and you are unequally yoked. Maybe you are finding yourself frustrated because you want to continue to go further in your faith and they don't. I want to give you some encouragement today. And I want to talk specifically to the women who are married. Married to maybe an unbeliever. Maybe you are married to somebody who was a believer and maybe they've fallen away. Or maybe you are married to someone who is kicking the tires on this whole faith thing and they're not really sure that they are with you. They're not really sure that they believe what you believe. Maybe you've had conversations with them and they have told you things like, hey, you believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. I'm not sure that I'm sold out on that whole idea. You go to church, you know, you study your Bible, you do all that you need to do, but they aren't doing anything to activate their own faith. I want to talk to you today. And I want to tell you not to be discouraged. First and foremost, not to be discouraged. I know that it's hard. I know. I've been there. I have, I have walked that road before. My story is very similar to your story. My story is that I wasn't married to, to a full-out unbeliever. I was married to someone who thought he was a good guy and going to heaven because of it, and yet he did not know Jesus for himself. And so it was several years into our marriage that he received Jesus, that he gave his life to Christ, that he fully repented of his sins, he turned from his old ways, and he became a new creature in Christ. And it was a few years, and it took a lot of faithful praying. It took a lot of believing that God was going to change his heart. I didn't want to change my husband. I had no I had no desire in my heart to change who he was, to change um, you know, what what kind of good man he was, what kind of husband he was, what kind kind of father he was to our daughter. I didn't want to change him. I simply wanted him to know Jesus. I simply wanted the security knowing that he was going to go to the same place I'm going to go to when I pass away, right? And so I wanted him to experience Christ the way that I had been able to experience him. And oftentimes it is our natural tendency women when our spouse is not walking the same path that we're walking to get frustrated. And not only to get frustrated but to beat him up about it, right? It's our natural bent, it's our natural tendency to Take control in this area because oftentimes it is the woman that either finds Jesus first or um, the woman who is more open 
to theological discussions or more open to receiving Jesus or needing to go to church. It's usually the woman that, that this, this, that, that has been my experience. I got, there's no data that I have to prove that, but that has been my personal experience in years that I have had talking with people in the faith, that it's typically the woman who has a more sincere heart bent towards Jesus than her spouse. And so we have a significant role to play in the spiritual life of our spouse. I believe that with everything in me. I believe that we have such an important job to do, such an important assignment as women of the Lord to lead our husbands by example. Now, when I did this um, godly series last year, I used for my backdrop, I used 1 Peter chapter 3. And I talked a lot about that throughout all four messages. That was kind of, again, the backdrop to what I was talking about. And I think it was so important for me because I have been there for one. And number two, I have a tendency to be a controller. And so oftentimes it's our, again, our natural bent to really want them to experience what we've experienced. And so what ends up becoming just natural is a nagging or a... Um, like a complaining, right? We, we begin to complain that they're not being the godly leader in our family. And we tell him things like, well, if you were reading your scriptures like I am, you would know these truths. Or we say, well, I really expected that we would be going to church as a family. Why don't you want to go every single Sunday like I do, right? So we begin to bash and we don't do this, I don't think we set ourselves up intentionally to do this in the beginning, but we, we, we do end up bashing our spouse or belittling our spouse or usurping the power that he has as the leader of your family. Now, he might not be right now the spiritual leader that he needs to be for your family, but he will never become that as long as you are taking control. He will never become that because as long as you are taking control, you are misaligning the order that God set up. And the order is God, then husband is responsible to God for the way that he led his family. So God, husband, wife is in submission to God through her husband. And this is the order of of God for the family and then kids underneath of that. And so a lot of times when we come in and we say things like, well, you're not being the spiritual leader of our family and you're not reading your Bible the way that you need to, or you're not going to church or you're not this, this, and this, and this, you are setting yourself up for a disaster. You are setting him up to fail because you're already you're already communicating to him that he's a failure and I don't mean to I don't mean to be mean when I say this because I've been there I trust me I've been there I remember when we had determined that we were going to go to church as a family after my daughter was born and my husband didn't go to church for the first few years of her life with me and it was so frustrating to me and I would use that as a tactic of almost manipulation early on. And, and I'm not proud of that. And I would say things like, well, you need to be reading your Bible. Well, you need to be in church. Well, you need to, you need to, you need to do all of these things. And what I was doing unnecessarily, and I, I wasn't doing it intentionally, I, I guess I should say unintentionally, is I was backing him further and further and further against the wall and in a place where he felt completely belittled, he felt undermined, he felt not respected, he felt not loved and not cared for. And I didn't mean for that to happen. I simply wanted him to experience Jesus the way that I was I was getting the I was having the privilege of experiencing him for myself. I wanted that for him. So as much as you want that for him, the tactic to apply to your side of trying, trying to win him to your side is never to do it 
with manipulation, never to do it with guilt and shame or belittling him or disrespecting him. That is not the place that we are, that's not the, the place that we're not supposed to do that. We are not supposed to be behaving like that as women who are in submission to our spouse, who ultimately is responsible for the way he led his family spiritually at the end of the day and at the end of his life, right? So I want you to think about this verse. I want you to think about these couple verses as we read through together. First Peter chapter three, I'm going to start in verse one. Not sure how long I'm going to go. I think it's just, I think it's just the first couple verses. So Peter is speaking about wives here and the instruction for wives here. And I think that this is the best advice given on this subject in all of scripture. He says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husband's then even if some refuse to obey the good news, that means if some are unwilling to receive Jesus, if they remain hard-hearted and they totally denounce Christ and they don't want anything to do with your God, even if they refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. We cannot continue to beat our spouses up for not being the spiritual leader in our families as they ought to be and expect them to want to be a part of our Christianity. How can we beat our spouses up for not being the man that they were called to be if we are belittling them and we are, we are shaming them and we are making them feel guilty and we are accusing them of wrongdoing? And how can we do this to them and then expect that they would want anything to do with our lifestyle, the lifestyle that we say that we promote because of our relationship with Jesus. You see how those two things don't correlate. You and I have to be Jesus with skin on for our spouses. We have to be a good, godly example. That means we have to make good choices. That means we have to love even when it's hard. That means we have to forgive others for not being perfect. That means that we have to love well and, and give grace and compassion. That means that we have to desire our husbands and desire the very best for him. That means that we have to pray actively for the salvation of his soul. That means that we have to refrain from things like gossip and, and just speaking ill about other people. That means that we have to live lives like the scriptures tell us that we're to live. Reverent, pure, holy, righteous lives. Because in some cases, that is the only example of Christ that he's ever going to see. And it ought to come from the one that he is the closest to. It ought to. So when they see our godly lives, what does it say? Let's go back. Even if some, so we must accept the authority of our husbands. He's in the position of authority. We might not like it. We might not think he's doing a good job. It's very similar to government, right? We might not agree with the choices that they're making. We might all collabor collaboratively agree that they're doing a horrible job. And we might, we might very much dislike the people who are in power. But did, do you know that they were appointed there? Those positions were appointed there by God. And because of that, we have to respect that position and that person. Because they have been appointed there to do an assignment by God. And the same way goes for 
our husbands and our family. He has, he has, ours, our God has appointed our husband, our spouse, as the leader in authority over our households. That means at the end of his life, he will have to give an account. On judgment day, he will have to give an account for what he did with Jesus this side of eternity. And that's going to mean how he led you as his wife and how he led his family. And so we have to honor that position that God has given him. And we have to be in subjection to the authority of our spouse. And just like government, he might not be doing it the way that we would. He might not be acting the way that we want him to act. He might not be doing it with reverency. He might not be doing it biblically. But he is still in a place of authority. And we need to respect that authority that he has. Now, listen, I know women, we have a really hard time with this. But all over scripture, we see that there are there, there is authority and subjection of that authority. We see that with slaves and masters. We see that with children and their parents. We see that with wives and husbands. We see that with with. Uh, people of a nation to the authority of government or kingship, right? It's the same thing. We see this order all over the scriptures. And so this is a definitive order by God. This is an order that cannot be disturbed or disrupted. So it says, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. We must accept that. We have to get out of our minds right now that we are the spiritual leaders of our family, that we are in control, that we are the boss. Let that go. That is a worldly vantage point. That is a worldly perspective. And we need to get rid of that. And we need to respect the authority that our husband has been given by God as the order of the family unit. So, we need to accept the authority of our husbands. That's first and foremost what we need to deal with. And we need to reconcile that in our heart. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives, the way that you live, the way that you behave, the way that you act, it's not like the rest of the world. Ladies, this means when we go out with our friends... And we're having, you know, dinner with girlfriends that we haven't seen in a while. And we're all getting together. That means that we don't sit around talking badly about our, our spouses or letting anyone say to you within that group, girl, I wouldn't put up with that. And you to be influenced by those people who are trying to get you to think and act and behave like the world because you, my dear friend, are a Christ follower. You are different. You are not the same. Once you've given your heart to Jesus, once you've given your life to him, your old sinful self is gone. You are no, no longer harboring any obligation to that sinful life. You are a new creation. You are a new creature. You have a new life. You have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And you are a child of God who does not act like that. So you don't get with the wrong company, intermix with that wrong crowd, who can negatively influence you by telling you, well, I would never be in subjection to my husband because he's an idiot. And you don't need to be... You don't need to be in subjection to your man. You are woman, girl boss, hashtag girl boss. Listen, there's nothing that is more worldly for us to adopt in our womanhood than that kind of mindset. So we have to erase that completely. Get rid of that mindset. Get rid of that thinking. Woman, you have been called by God to love and respect and honor your spouse. When you said, I do, when you became one with that spouse of yours, whether or not he is living a godly life or not, you 
have an assignment given now by God to be his helpmate, to honor and respect him, and to be in submission to his authority. Do I mean that you stay with an abusive spouse? No. And I want you to hear that loud and clear. I have had women, women who have pushed back on this issue with me after having watched some of the Godly Wife series messages and said that I was being unrealistic. And can I tell you, yeah, this stuff is unrealistic if you are looking through the lens of a worldly perspective, but you and I do not live from a worldly perspective. You and I live from a heavenly perspective. We have God as our guide. We are living from a kingdom mindset. We no longer belong to this world. We belong to heaven. It's our home. It's where we're going. And kingdom is the kingdom mindedness is the adoptive mind that we have to have. And so we have to be very careful in this area because I know the temptation in our modern day 21st century, the year 2023, we have everything in us to want to be the boss, to want to be in charge, to want to do all the things that men do, to be in control. And it's not the order that God assigned for the family unit. It's not. And the sooner that we realize our position as wives and mamas in the kingdom, the better off we will be, our husbands will be, because now we've given him room to be all that God wants him to be. You know, sometimes we are, we're in such control of, of what he's doing and, and we, we, we hold over him. This is what you need to do and this is how you need to behave and why aren't you doing this right and that right? So many times we do this and when we do this, we are stealing away from what was rightly theirs, what is rightly theirs given to them by God. We are usurping that power. And what we are doing is we are making men weak. And when men are weak, an entire society suffers. Not just the family, but an entire society suffers when we have weak men. So we have to be careful to not create weak men who say, well, I guess I'm, I, I guess I am, I'm not a very good spouse. I guess I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. But how will they ever want what we have unless they see it in us first? Let's go back. We always go back to scripture. Don't take my word for it. Take the scripture's word for it. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly life will speak to them without any words. The best thing that you can do outside of praying for your spouse is being a godly example. Showing Jesus to them. Being Jesus with skin on. Showing what it means to forgive. Showing what it means to offer radical grace. Showing what it means to die to self every single day. Showing what it means to be faithful. Showing what it means to show up every day at the scriptures, begging God to teach you something new. This is how we demonstrate a godly life for our spouses who may never, ever see Christ, if not for, for us. They will be won over, it says this in verse 2, by observing your pure and reverent lives. That's how they're won over. Listen, we often think we have to use big words and scare tactics and measures of fear and 
and making sure they know how angry we are at them for not being godly. Do you know how counterintuitive that is? Think about how counterintuitive that is. Yelling and being angry at our spouse for not behaving godly is in fact behaving ungodly. So why would they want to be a part of that if they see that in us? So sister, I invite all of us to a new way of thinking. Let's think biblically. Let's believe that God has a specific order in mind for how the family is to flow. Let's see ourselves serving the Lord, loving the Lord, faithfully following the Lord by being in subjection to the one the Lord has appointed in authority and headship over us. This is the way that we love the Lord. We love him through our submission of authority. It's how it works. And it doesn't work outside of this. Listen, I, I sincerely believe it's why. It's why we have so much, so much messed up in the family units. I, I think it's why we see so much upset in our families right now. Why we see so much disorder and chaos and unfaithfulness and anxiety and stress. I, I think that we see all of this because somehow, somewhere, the family unit has been dismantled. The family order has been unordered, disordered. And we have to get that back. If we want to live lives that are holy and reverent and set apart, and we desire to have our families experience peace and, and tranquility and contentment and joy, then we have to, we have to get back to what is the order that God has established. What is that order? And ladies, you play an important role in that order. You play a huge role in the order of things in your family. Did you know that your role, according to scripture, is to take care of your family, to manage your household well, to steward it well, to raise those babies to love Jesus, to serve your spouse, and by serving him, then you are being an example of what a godly family looks like to your children. And if you don't think that they deserve that, can you think about Jesus and how he deserves for us to behave in a way that promotes godly living within the walls of our home? It is so so important. I have so much more to say on this. I know that I'm over for a snippet video. I thank you for being here and listening to this. And I hope that you were encouraged. If you find yourself in a place where you're like, this is me and I need help, would you do me a couple things? Would you reach out to me? I would love to pray for you specifically. I would love to help you in your marriage. My husband and I did marriage mentoring for years. It was one of the things that we absolutely loved to do together. And yes, we don't have a perfect marriage by any means, but I believe that the Lord has, 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 has given us insight and clarity and wisdom in this area. And I would love to dialogue with you and walk alongside of you in this journey. But would you also do me another favor and click on some of those Godly Wife series videos and watch them? They're long. I understand that they are, but I promise you that there will be something in there that you can use today to begin to activate this kind of behavior in your family. And I promise you that if you stay the course, if you, if you pray for that husband of yours, and, and, and you, if you see any good in him, that you would pray into that and that you would be a good, godly example for him, I believe that God will change 
your husband's mind. He will change his mind and his heart. I believe that. And I am believing that for you today. So I love you. I am praying for you. I know that these are hard truths, but they are truths nonetheless. They are right straight from scripture. Again, never take my word for it. Go to those videos. I give you a lot of biblical resources. Get into those videos. Watch them for yourselves. Take notes if you have to. And remember in the meantime to focus on getting your heart right, living pure, reverent, holy, righteous lives. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first. Let that be the pursuit of your heart, the cry of your heart. And be a good, godly example, not just for your husband, but you have this assignment, friends, to be the example for your entire household. You get to set the tone for that entire household. What an honor and what a godly privilege. I love you, friends, and I will talk to you soon.